Jeopardy. Let's get into this. We're going to go at a relatively um, fast pace um, to just get through all of this without being here for too long, but it's going to be a lot of great information and it'll test your knowledge. So let's start with transfer of title number one. This type of will is written, dated, and signed by the testator's own handwriting and is not witnessed. So if it's not witnessed, we know it's not a witnessed will. Then we can think of, okay, if it's in its own, their own handwriting, the thing that should come to mind is if it's in the testator's own handwriting, it should be holographic will. That's what we should be thinking of. Yep, holographic will. So this is one that's not witnessed and in the testator's own handwriting. So the person that's actually devising the property, holographic will. This is the extension of an owner's title to real property through either annexation, man-made, or accretion naturally occurring. So transfer of title, so they're gaining title, um, have extending title of their property due to either man-made or naturally occurring reasons. So we know it's not accretion or annexation, but those fall under a session. A session. This is when a person dies without a will. However, they do have heirs and the law provides for, for disposition of the person's property. So they don't have a will, um, but they do have heirs. They didn't, so because there's not a will, the um, devisor didn't leave a way for, um, how to be, for it to be distributed. So the law will provide for how the property um, or the person's property is disposed. Um, and when they do have heirs, what do we call this? Interstate secession. <laughs> interstate secession. Not interstate, but it's interstate secession. This is when a person dies without a will and without heirs. So the property is given to the state of California. Okay, so there's no will, no heirs. What's supposed to happen? Well, the property will be deeded to the state of California after a five-year period has passed and no one has a claim to the property because it is assumed that there will be heirs to it. But once there aren't heirs and it's been five years, it will a sheet to the state of the California. Let's have that here, a sheet. A property can be acquired by adverse possession when a person uses another person's property while fulfilling these requirements. So when you think of adverse possession, which acronym comes to mind? Well, it should be OUCH plus taxes. So you have to fulfill OUCH and then also pay taxes for adverse possession to happen because adverse possession, you gain title. So ouch, remember, is open and notorious, uninterrupted use for a period of five years or more, claim of rights, as well as hostile to the owner's intent, owner's title and intent. But there also has to be the element of taxes, the payment of all real property taxes for a period of five years for this, um, for this person to obtain title by adverse possession. Now, when you think of ouch, you also might be thinking of a prescriptive easement where, where that gains use. So you would just fulfill ouch and you gain use through a prescriptive easement. But if you have ouch and the payment of property taxes, then you can gain title and that is through adverse possession. Deeds. This deed is used to remove someone from title to a property and has no warranties expressed or implied. So a deed that is used to usually remove someone from title, that should be our first clue. And then also no warranties expressed or implied. Well, if we think through all of our deeds, the one that should come to mind is quit claim. Because remember, quit claim, I like to say it's quitting the claim of someone. So removing someone from title, you are quitting their claim to that property. So quit claim deed. A deed has no effect unless this is done. So when we think of a deed, what needs to be done for it to be an effective deed? I'll give you a moment. It doesn't need to be recorded or acknowledged, 
but it does need to be delivered. Delivery has to be done for a deed to be effective. This is what the person conveying the real property is called. So person conveying the real property is called. So what do we think of here? So the person giving title, um, deeding the title over, they are the grantor. Person receiving the property is the grantee. Grantor is the person conveying the real property. This deed guarantees clear title to real property. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the chain of recorded title. Warranty deeds are not normally used in California. Well, I just gave the answer away with this. <laughs> Oops, I should have read it all, but I thought I got rid of that in the clue. Well, we know this is when um, we don't use them in California, but because it, it's really hard to guarantee clear title um, all the way back to the beginning of the chain of recorded title. So this is warranty deeds. Um, and there's also a warranty deed called a special warranty deed that only goes back to the person that is conveying the property. They're just guaranteeing it clear to when that person obtained the property. But in this case, we're talking about a warranty deed, not normally used in California. I accidentally left that in there in the clue. My bad. <laughs> a grant deed contains these two implied warranties. Okay, so grant deed. I'm gonna have you think about this for a moment. What are the two implied warranties? Well, remember quick claim deeds don't have implied or expressed warranties, but a grant deed does. So they have it to where the grantor has not previously moved the title to anyone else. They've not conveyed the title to anyone else. They haven't sold the property and have conveyed it. It's good to go to someone else. And the grantor has disclosed to grantee all that is known about the grantor's interest in the property. So these are the two implied warranties. New homes, subdivisions. So really we're gonna spend more time on subdivision. <laughs> a subdivision must be of at least this many lots. So what's the minimum amount of lots for subdivision? Well, the number that should be coming to mind is five. Five lots or more to be considered a subdivision. This allows the enactment of zoning laws limiting the use of real property. So when we think of zoning, what should come to mind? Well. Zoning is used to implement the master um, general and master plans, but who actually has is the power that um, to really enact these zoning laws? Well, police power. This is when a property changes from Z1 zoning to R1 zoning. So it's basically downgrading in the zoning. It's going from commercial to residential. And the technical term for this is down zoning. The real estate commissioner's public report must be given to this person. Okay, so the public report, what do we know about it? Well, it has to be given to anyone who requests it, whether it's a, a written request or if it's an oral request, it has to be provided to anyone requesting it, but it also needs to be provided to all home buyers in the subdivision purchasing a property in that subdivision. Okay. These apply if a property is sub subdivided into five parcels. So we know of a subdivision map act that deals where if you are dividing one property into two or more, then the subdivide, subdivision map act applies. If you are subdividing a property into five or more um, parcels, then the subdivided lands law applies. So if it's subdividing it into five parcels, um, five parcels or more, then both apply. So the subdivision map act as well as the subdivided lands law. Property management. 
Lease that continues for a definite and specified period of time. This could be for two months, six months, one year, or five years. So you should be thinking of your leasehold estates. Which one is for a definite period of time? Has a start and an end date. Well, estate for years. But remember, even though it has years in the name, it doesn't need to be for years. It can be for one day, two days. Vacation rentals are estate for years, for instance. They don't need to be years. Lease that continues from one period to another, okay? Well, a key word there is period. So lease that continues from one period to another. So we know it's not a state for years, but one that is has this period of time and it keeps basically renewing and it just does another period of time should come to mind is periodic tenancy, which is also the technical term, a state from period to period. The lease that occurs when a state for years expires and the tenant stays on and continues paying rent on a month to month basis. So it had an estate for years and then it basically is converted into a periodic tenancy. This lease is called, what is it called? An estate at will. So they are willingly deciding to stay in the property and the tenant will continue to pay rent. Lease that occurs when a tenant stays in a property and does not continue to pay rent. So the landlord is now suffering because the tenant is not paying rent and they're staying in the property. So they would have to start eviction proceedings. Well, this is a type of lease and it is called the state at sufferance. Because remember, the landlord is suffering. Someone's suffering and it's the landlord who's not getting money. And they may have to pay money to get them out. The correct order of the eviction process involves these three steps. So I wanna give you a moment to think of this, three steps. The first one is you gotta let them know to pay. They didn't pay, so they need to know, and they usually are given three days to do so. What is that called? A three-day notice to pay rent or quit. If they do not um, pay rent nor quit the premise, then what's the next step that comes into mind? Well. An unlawful, unlawful detainer action will have to be filed. And then once that's filed, you'll get a writ of possession um, when the eviction is approved. And this will actually get the um, tenant out of the property. So these are the three steps. Remember, writ of possession, though. You might have heard writ of execution when we're talking about attachments, judgments, um, and writ of executions. But that is not here. Writ of possession. This is the order to actually implement the eviction. A landlord must return the security deposit less cost for damages and unpaid rent within this amount of time of a tenant vacating the property. So in California, we know we have to return the unused portion of the security deposit, um, including a report of ex um, accounting for those expenses. Well, it has to be provided within 21 days. The maximum amount a landlord can charge for a security deposit of an unfurnished property is this. So the maximum amount for a security deposit when it's an unfurnished property, well, when you see unfurnished for California, you should be thinking two months. Two months for unfurnished, that's the maximum. But for a furnished property, it would be three months is the maximum for security deposit. Three months rent. This type of lease requires the tenants in the building to pay their pro rata share of the property owner's operating expenses. This is common for um, commercial properties, um, retail especially, um, that tenants will be paying a base rent plus their pro rata share of the property owner's operating expenses. So taxes, insurance, the common area maintenance charges. And what type of lease is this in? This is in a triple net lease, a net lease also. So triple net, net lease, they're both kind of synonymous for the state exam purposes. You see three N's, two back to back, so N, 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 that also refers to a triple, triple net lease. This type of lease contains an escalator clause to adjust the rental amount periodically 
usually annually, for inflation? Well, when it has an escalator clause in the lease, the thing that should come to mind is, you, should be, you know, we already talked about net lease, we've already talked about other types of leases, but what is this one? Graduated lease, so graduated, so kind of think of it like steps, and that's like an escalator clause. Last one for property management. A sandwich lease is the interest of this person when a property is subleased. Okay, so when we have a sublease, we have the person who is the landlord. So they are the lessor and they give the property, they rent the property, give possession to the property to the lessee, who's the tenant. At that point, the tenant may want to then sublease the property. So the lessee becomes the sub lessor and then the new lessee is considered the um, sub lessee. Well, who's the one sandwiched between the lessor and the sub lessee? It's the sub lessor. And that is what we call sandwich lease when we're talking about sub leases. And it's the sub lessor. And for this question, who has the interest of the sandwich lease? The fiscal property tax year starts and ends on these two dates. Okay, so pro, um, fiscal property tax year. We're not talking about a calendar property um, calendar year because property taxes use a fiscal tax year. So when we do so, we know it's going to be um, a little different. Well, the start date is July 1st and the end date is June 30th, respectively. Taxation continued. When property taxes are not paid on time, they become this on real property. Property taxes are extremely important. They need to be paid. And if they're not paid, they become an encumbrance on the property, an encumbrance based on money, which we know is called a lien. So property taxes, if they are unpaid, become a lien on the property. A single person may take up to this amount of the home sale proceeds, and a married couple can take up to this amount of the sale proceeds tax-free, so no capital gains tax on these amounts. One stipulation, though, is that the homeowners must have lived in the residence at least two years out of the last five. So when we know about this, what is the amount of money that a single person can take tax-free if they've lived in their property for two out of the last five years? Capital gains of free money is $250,000 for a single person, and a married couple can take up to $500,000 tax-free. These are the straight-line depreciation schedules for residential and commercial properties. Okay, so how many years do we have for a straight-line depreciation schedule for residential properties? Well... What should be coming to mind? So when we're doing um, calculating depreciation, for instance, for residential properties, for instance, residential real estate, we divide it usually for a depreciation schedule straight line of 27 and a half years. Now, commercial properties, usually um, it's, more, it's more. And so how many years is that? Well, we do a straight line depreciation schedule of 39 years for commercial properties. Okay, taxation. The due and delinquent dates of the two property tax installments are these dates. So let's break it down. The first property tax install, um, installments, we know, so the property tax year starts on July 1st. When's the first installment due? Well, November 1st. And then it's delinquent on December 10th. Then for the second property tax installment, it becomes due on February 1st, but it's delinquent though, not in March, but it's actually April 10th. So first installment due on November 1st and delinquent on December 10th. Second installment is due on February 1st and delinquent on April 10th. A good way to remember this is no darn fooling around. Good way to remember these dates. The 
Real property in California is taxed ad valorem, which means this. So when you hear ad valorem, the first thing that should come to mind is it, well, it deals with property taxes, but that it means according to value. Because real property is a tax in California according to its true value, ad valorem. This occurs when the property increases in value and an investor receives a profit on the sale of the property. So the, um, when the investor receives a profit on the sale of the property because there is an increase in value, what is that called? It's a capital gain. The county collects a documentary transfer tax of this amount for every $500 of new money in a transaction. So documentary transfer tax applies. So for, um, for every $500 of new money into the transaction, the county will take 55 cents. Another way to look at it is $1.10 for every $1,000. Um, so 55 cents for every $500 of new money or $1.10 for every thousand of new money. Um, remember new money is like the new cash, so new loans, new cash, but it doesn't apply to loan assumptions because that's not new money in the transaction. Clause that allows lender to call entire loan balance due and payable immediately if owner conveys the property. Allows the lender to call the entire loan balance due and payable immediately if the owner conveys the property. Well, this should come to mind, alienation. Because what does alienation mean? That means to sell, to convey the property. And so if it's, um, and that is called a due on sale clause as well. So when um, the property is sold and the property is conveyed, for instance, the alienation clause takes effect and the entire loan balance will become due and payable immediately. So due on its sale, due on sale. This is a formula to calculate, to calculate the adjusted cost basis. Hmm. Okay, let's see here. Formula to calculate the adjusted cost basis. Hmm, okay. So let's see here. We have the unadjusted cost basis we start with. And what do we add? Well, we add the acquisition and the settlement costs. We also add permanent improvements. But what do we subtract? Well, you remember that depreciation we were talking about? Well, that depreciation is accrued depreciation. And at that point, we get the adjusted cost basis. This is really important to know. Okay, last one, exchanges. This is when each investor exchanges properties directly to each other. So directly, each investor, they have their property and they do a direct exchange. Well, we call that a straight across. Straight across exchange. This is when an investor sells property and reinvests proceeds into another like-kind property within a prescribed time period. So, you know, the instead of um, having a straight-across exchange, the investor will sell the property, and then once it's sold and they have the proceeds, they'll go find a like-kind property um, afterwards, but within a prescribed time period. What is that called? Well, this is really what we most deal with in real estate. It's called a delayed exchange. The tax code, though, is 1031. So 1031 exchange, too. So those are synonymous, delayed exchange, 1031 exchange um, for state exam purposes when you're dealing with real property. Exchanges allow this of capital gain taxes. So when you think of an exchange, the reason why investors do this is because they don't want to pay taxes on the capital gains that they would get. They reinvest it in another property, and they are basically postponing the payment of capital gains taxes. They are deferring it. So 
eventually will be paid unless they convert it to their primary residence and live there for five years. But um, they will be, they're just postponing the um, deferring the payment of the capital gain taxes. An investor in a 1031 exchange must identify <laughs> a replacement property in this amount of time. Must identify a replacement property. So identify the identification period of a 1031 exchange is 45 days. Last one, an investor in a 1031 exchange must must acquire a replacement property in this amount of time. Okay, so we know the identification period is 45 days, but they must close and acquire that replacement property in 180 days. Okay, that's it for this Jeopardy. Hope you enjoyed it.